Hybridization builds directly off of VSEPR theory, so if you haven't watched my video over that yet, I recommend watching that first, before continuing with this one. First of all, what even is hybridization? Hybridization is the process of mixing an atom's atomic orbitals to form new hybrid orbitals, which are better suited for bonding. As with all other reasons for bonding happening in chemistry, atoms undergo hybridization to lower their energy level and make bonding easier. Let's take a quick moment now to try and clear up some misunderstandings that might exist when it comes to bonding, or even just the existence of valence electrons. I know this image looks super confusing, but we're not really going to dive into it very deeply, I just want to go surface level. This is the part in chemistry where everything becomes easier if we truly consider what an electron domain looks like. Imagine we have a carbon atom and a hydrogen atom. If we were to draw a bond between each one of these, we would draw a single line, right? That's what makes the most sense for us to picture a bond. But obviously, this isn't what's actually going to happen in real life. Rather, electron domains are crossing over each other so that they can be shared between the nuclei of each atom. Imagine instead we drew our carbon atom and an electron domain, and our hydrogen atom and an electron domain. When we bond, we're taking this hydrogen and we're crossing the electron domains over one another. And that's what this image down here is showing. As you can see, electron domains are crossing over each other, and that's why our bonds are forming. If you start thinking about bonds in this manner, the rest of this video should start making a lot more sense. So that's just what I want you to do. You don't have to worry about it too much, but instead of just thinking we're going to draw lines to represent a bond between two atoms, start thinking, hey, we're actually taking their electron domains, which are these weird bubble-like shapes, and we're crossing those over one another. Let's now jump back to hybridization. The only thing that's actually required of you on the AP exam when it comes to hybridization is to identify the level of hybridization of each type of molecule, which fortunately is an extremely easy thing to do. We have to start by finding the steric number of our molecule. Remember that this is just the total number of electron domains. Off of this, we then just assign a hybridization depending on how large our steric number is. A steric number of 2 will have a hybridization of sp. A steric number of 3 will have a hybridization of sp2. 4, of course, will then have a hybridization of sp3. And after that, when we go to 5, we need to jump up to a higher sublevel. So this would have a hybridization of sp3d. Steric number of 6 would then be sp3d2. And in theory, the sequence will continue in this manner forever. Although for AP chemistry, you'll almost never go beyond a steric number of 6. Let's now try this on a few molecules. Pictured here, I have the Lewis dot diagram for the methane molecule, chemical formula CH4. What is the hybridization of our central carbon atom? Well, let's start by finding our steric number. We have four regions of electron density. So we have a steric number of four. Because our steric number of four, we know that our hybridization is sp3. And that's literally it. That is exactly how simple finding the hybridization for an atom is. Let's do the same for water. This water also has four regions of electron density. So our steric number is 4, and because of that, our hybridization is sp3. That right there is how we would find the hybridization of an atom. Pretty simple, right? Just remember the steric number and how that corresponds to our actual hybridization. What is actually happening, though, when we say that something is hybridized? To answer this, let's go back to our initial definition of hybridization. Remember that hybridization is the process of making atomic orbitals to form hybrid orbitals better suited for bonding. What's that saying? We hybridize so we can form bonds. And that's a really important principle that you need to understand. The reason we're doing this hybridization is so that we can form bonds. By forming hybrid orbitals, it's easier to form bonds, and so hybridization is directly intertwined with bonding. So let me show you exactly what's going on when something is being hybridized. Imagine back to our methane molecule, CH4. Again, we know that our carbon has an sp3 hybridization. This is going to tie into a topic from a while back, but do you remember what the electron configuration of carbon is? That's 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And if we were to draw this out, we would get two electrons in our s orbital, two electrons in our second s orbital, and then two lone electrons in our p sublevel. 
Remember that for a bond to form, we take one lone electron and another lone electron, and they come together, and then they form a bond. And that's that crossing over of electron domains, the one I was showing you with the big wonky circles. So as you can see, we have one electron here and one electron here. We could form bonds within these orbitals. I'm going to do something a little strange. I'm not going to go into detail why it happens. I'm just going to do it, and you're just going to have to trust me that this is something carbon does. But so the first step we're going to do is called the promotion step. Carbon is going to take this electron, and it's going to shoot it over there. And so because of that, we'll get one electron there, and we'll remove that one. There will be a full video explaining this, why it happens, why carbon does it, why does oxygen not do it, etc., etc., in the future. Don't worry about it for now. What you do need to worry about is our value right here, sp3. What this means is that we have one part s orbital, three parts p orbital. Let's take a look at our s and our p orbitals. As you can see, our p orbitals each have one lone electron. One, two, three. And our s orbital here has one lone electron. So what is this right here? This is our sp3 hybridization. And what can we infer by looking at it? We have four lone spots where four different hydrogens could come in, give an electron, and we could form a bond. And that right there is what it means when something is hybridizing. When the carbon atom is hybridizing, it is literally mixing and matching its orbitals so that it can form more favorable bonds. Because the more bonds you form, the lower your potential energy, the more stable you are. So carbon wants to form all of these bonds. So that right there is what's actually happening in hybridization. I'm going to do this again, this time for the oxygen atom in water. So again, water, chemical formula, H2O. And if we were to then draw our Lewis dot diagram, we can see that water, the oxygen atom, is also sp3 hybridized. What is the electron configuration for water? It is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. So if we then were to draw this out, we'd see that our first s sublevel has two electrons in it, our second s sublevel has two electrons, and then our p sublevel has one, two, three, four. It has two unpaired electrons in the p sublevel. We are not going to do a promotion step because imagine we took this electron and we shot it over here. Yeah, we've just opened up a new spot for bonding, but we've removed this spot for bonding. So it wouldn't make any sense to do that. So we're not going to have a promotion step. We are, however, sp3 hybridized. So that means we are one part s orbital, three parts p orbital. Let's take a look at our s orbital. As you can see, we have two electrons in there, one, two. Let's then look at our p orbitals. We have two electrons in the first orbital, one electron in the second orbital, and one electron in the third orbital. As you can see, we have two spots where hydrogen could come in and donate an electron forming a bond, and these other two spots over here already have full electrons. So those would be our lone pairs. And I think that that's really cool. We can use hybridization to predict how these bonds will form. Again, that is hybridization's definition. We are mixing and matching our orbitals to make forming bonds more favorable. And so that's what's actually happening when we talk about something being hybridized. If it is sp3 hybridized, such as the oxygen atom in water, we are looking at one s orbital and at three p orbitals, and we're trying to see how do the electrons look there, how will bonds form there. The other part of hybridization we need to talk about is our sigma and pi bonds. What even are sigma and pi bonds? The actual definition of sigma and pi bonds is pretty simple. A sigma bond is a strong single bond formed by the direct head-to-head -head overlapping of orbitals. An emphasis on the strong. Sigma bonds are strong. Pi bonds are weaker bonds that are formed on top of this. We call these double or triple bonds, and they are formed by the sideways overlap of orbitals. Their sideways overlap formation is why pi bonds are weaker than sigma bonds. We can think of these as our double or triple bonds. On the AP exam, you need to be able to identify the number of sigma and pi bonds located in a region of electron density. And this is pretty easy to do. Observe here the Lewis dot structure for glucose. At least I think it's glucose. I don't know, biology is pretty hard, but it does say glucose down here. So I'm assuming this is glucose. At this topmost carbon oxygen bond, how many sigma bonds do we have and how many pi bonds do we have? Well, remember that a sigma bond is our first connection. 
Every bond contains one sigma bond because the sigma bond is our single bond. So this bond right here contains one sigma bond. How many pi bonds does this bond contain? Well, every other bond on top of a sigma bond counts as one pi bond. If we had a double bond, we would have one pi bond on top of a sigma bond. If we had a triple bond, we would have two pi bonds on top of a sigma bond. Since this is a double bond, we have one pi bond. So this spot right here is one sigma, one pi. Let's do right here now. We start with a single bond. So we know that we have one sigma bond because the sigma bond, again, is our first initial bond. And on top of that, we don't have a double or triple bond, so we have zero pi bonds. And that right there is all you'd have to do for identifying how many sigma and pi bonds you have. That's definitely the easiest part of this video. I don't think you'll be struggling with this whatsoever in your chemistry class. And that right there is everything that will be expected of you when it comes to hybridization in chemistry. I know that this was a lot of information to take in at once, so if any part of this was unclear, try rewatching parts of the video. If it's still not making sense, take a break and come back later. Thank you so much for watching.